hope um, you're all feeling rested and rejuvenated after a, a little winter break. Um, dare I say goodbye and good riddance to 2020. We're welcoming with open arms 2021. Uh, just a quick technical note to board members and anyone from the public who would like to make a public comment. Please do use your microphones and speak loudly, both so the Zoom audience can hear us and so the audience here can hear us. Um, happy anniversary to Jordan, who has officially been with us for a year, and what a year it has been. Um, Jordan, thank you for your hard work. <laughs> As our first order of business, um, we do have an organizational meeting that we need to uh, take care of uh, with Mrs. Migliaccio's uh, change in the board, uh, the board chair. We um, have decided that as a chair, it is very difficult for me to continue chairing the curriculum subcommittee. And Rosemary Weber, I was hoping that you would be willing to take over the chairmanship of that committee. Yes, I would. Thank you very much. I will continue to serve on that committee as an ex officio member. I spoke with Melissa Migliaccio this morning, and uh, her apology, she cannot be here in person as she is not feeling very well, um, but she has requested to join the finance subcommittee. Dave, I know you've expressed interest in joining the curriculum subcommittee, and would you be willing to move over to the curriculum subcommittee? Yes. Great, thank you very much. Um, so that continues our, our um, committees. The finance committee, which is chaired by Jenny Emery, will be made up of Mark Fiorentino and Melissa Migliaccio. And the curriculum subcommittee, which is now chaired by Rosemary Weber, will be um, made up of Brandon Webster and Dave Cullen. Thank you all for your continued leadership and service. Um, prior to winter break, um, Chairman, Vice Chairman Mark Fiorentino and I had the opportunity to visit all the schools, do a walkthrough, visit the classroom, thank the teachers and staff. It was really just wonderful to see great learning taking place. Um, we'd love to visit again. If anyone on the board would like to join us, please, uh, please let us know. And with that, I'll move on to Superintendent now. Super, thank you, Sarah. Well, good evening, everyone, and I want to welcome everyone to this meeting this morning. I hope everyone had an enjoyable holiday and an enjoyable break, if it was your time to take a break. So it has been a year, and I reflected back on the year, and last year at this time, at the first meeting, if you remember to each of the board members, and I believe you were all present, I gave you a card like I gave you today, with candy, that it was, if anybody recalls, it was an M and M. And in the little note that I wrote each of you, I said that it is my hope that this will be a magical and memorable year. That's what I wrote that day, that day a year ago. Magical and memorable for M and M. Well, it was certainly a magical year and it was certainly a memorable year. So tonight, what I did put on your uh, desk this evening is a, a, a note from me to you to thank each board member for the work that you have done this year and a small token of my appreciation. And as everyone knows that this is a volunteer position and it's a thankless position. But what I can give each of you, even though I can't pay you physically, is that I gave each of you a hundred grand bar. I know some of you may not be eating candy, but let that be a memorable uh, time for your work for a hundred grand um, with that bar. And, and hopefully next year, I'm coming out with sweet tarts to make sure that it is like a sweet year uh, coming up. So I do wanna thank all the board members for your work and your support this year to the superintendent of schools. Plus one budget will be presented this evening. There will not be a three board uh, meeting at this time. The selectmen uh, voted the other night to a uh, table for now a three board uh, meeting. The virtual discussion of the book, Waking Up White by Debbie, Debbie Irving will be held next Wednesday, January 13th from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. An incredible district-wide PJ, PJ Day fundraiser was held around the district in December. Approximately $4,000 was raised. Additionally, Wells Road collected 157 pairs of pajamas for children in need. What a great way for the Granby Public Schools to help our community. 
At our, one of our last meetings in December, we spoke about the performing arts here at the high school. I want to congratulate the high school drama club for its performance of a, a wonderful world. I had an opportunity to view that through live stream. I also want to congratulate all the artists that I was able to view, view live stream for the wonderful coffee house that the high school had before break. So our arts are alive and well at Granby Memorial High School. It was so nice to see both these events happen in a creative and a virtual type of way. So I thank the music department and I thank the high school administration and all the students for their leadership to make this happen. High school capstone projects are being presented this week. What a great experience for our high school seniors presenting their capstone. Capstone Assistant Superintendent Ann Parsons and myself had the opportunity to attend capstone presentations today. And they were held virtually and in person. Kids, students were in person, so that was great. And I thank the high school and the high school administration and the teachers for their leadership. As you know, and I'm sure Jack will talk about it tonight in his report, that the CIAC and the DPH are currently meeting regarding high school athletics. We are waiting word on what winter athletics, if there will be winter athletics, and what it may look like for the state of Connecticut in the next coming uh, weeks. As soon as we know, we will notify the community. And I've asked Athletic Director Maltese to come to a Board of Education meeting our next one on January 20th to speak about the state of our fall high school athletics and then provide an update on where our winter athletics will be. The building committee com continues to meet. Mrs. Robbins tonight will provide a brief update on where the building committee stands regarding the projects. If you remember, we did do a project over the past uh, two weeks at the Grammy Memorial Middle School with the middle school vestibule. I would ask all board members to stop by there one day and just see what that has done to the entrance of the middle school. It is absolutely amazing. And I wanna thank Mrs. Robbins and Mr. Sullivan for the work that they did and the middle school staff for being flexible. It's quite an entrance now to our middle school. There will be an early release on Monday, January 11th where professional development will be, which will be school-based. There will be no school on Monday, January 18th in observance of a holiday. The next regularly scheduled board meeting will be held Wednesday, January 20th. I'll take any questions out of the superintendent's office at this time. Thank you, Dr. Burton. Any questions? Okay, great. Thank you very much. We'll move on to uh, Jennifer Parsons for the assistant superintendent's report. Good evening, everyone. Happy New Year. Um, I would like to take a chance to also um, put in a plug for our virtual discussion with Debbie Irving next Wednesday night. Our Ramby Equity team and our Board of Education Extension group that has been reading her book, Waking Up White, have invited Debbie to join us here and for to put into context uh, historical perspective, systems of privilege, and her own awakening through um, reviewing those historical events. We will have uh, the event is open to the public. It is from six to eight next Wednesday, the 13th. And there will be a reminder going out to the entire uh, community tomorrow. Uh, we still have a, a few seats left for that. I'd like to take a few moments just to give you a few COVID updates as well. We've returned from the break and our students are very glad to be back. Our teachers are glad to be back. Um, and as you saw in a update, this week, we are upholding the 14 day quarantine in the school based setting. Um, so, hopefully, we will not need to implement that often. We have seen some cases coming off of break, but the good news is, is that people are all going by the daily screening tool and they are keeping themselves and their family home if needed. And as a result, even with the cases we've seen this week and last week, there is no impact on our school community because um, the individuals are staying home and have not been around others. We will continue to communicate those cases to you as they come up. And you may have noticed we also have a dashboard on our website now as well. Um, as a reminder, the metrics um, that were discussed by the state in, back in August have changed. In October, those were modified to be more of a continuum of in-person learning to more remote learning. 
So we are being advised to do a daily assessment of our schools and determine if there is a need to change models. In that daily assessment, we consult with the Farmington Valley Health District and ask ourselves two questions. Really, are, do we have enough staff to safely open our schools? And is, um, are the cases of COVID-19 impacting our schools to the extent where it may not be safe? And very rarely are the answers to either of those questions anything but, but no. So um, moving forward, in moving into 2021, we do believe that educators will are closer to a vaccine. The state has not established their phases yet, but we are we have reason to believe that teachers may be in phase 1B, but we are awaiting a, a great many details from the state. So in that vaccination process, we will support the work of the DPH and Farmington Valley Health District in helping to coordinate that with our employees. On a non-COVID level, um, we are beginning a work with our vision of the graduate. We have a committee scheduled to meet three times in January and February and hope to bring something forward to you in the very near future. Um, in terms of curriculum, we're working on math, music, and capstone as it is related to the vision of the graduate. I don't know if there's any questions. Brandon, do you have a question? Um, from the last meeting we had, uh, there's a public comment about the, uh, what guidelines are recommended from the health district as far as when we move between the models? Could you teach on that? Yes, that's what I was referring to with the daily assessment. There is no longer your cut scores in terms of 10s and 25s. It is really looking at the impact of um, COVID on the school based setting based on the recommendation of the DPH and the Farming to Valley Health District. As we learn more about COVID-19 and the way that it works, the ever-evolving knowledge base, um, what the state is communicating with us is that there is very minimal impact and spread within the school-based setting, um, going as far to say that school is perhaps the safest place to be outside of your home. So what, with that, that is where um, the new addendum four has been revised to ask to recommend that we consult with the Farmington Valley Health District for that daily risk assessment. And those two questions of can we safely operate with our staffing and is there an impact um, with the cases that we have on the, on the current um, population in schools. Thank you, Jen. You're welcome. Any other questions? Great. Thank you very much, Jennifer. We'll move on to student representative reports. I know you're all back in after a break. And midterms are, or exams are approaching. So, Jack, do you want to start tonight? All right, I will start. So, um, our National Honor Society for the holidays were taking donations to fill stockings for um, children in need, and they filled nearly 50, and they were all um, distributed before the holiday. And now the group is tutoring for exams. So, one to three students have signed up for each class that the underclassmen could be taking, and it's an um, hour long Zoom call. That is open and they can join in and just ask questions at will. And those students that have already taken the class will answer and be as much of a help as they can. And as Dr. Grossman touched on earlier, the CIC, uh, DPH, and Board of Control have all been meeting this week, tonight, and tomorrow. And we'll be deciding whether or not the season for winter, or the winter sports season will go on, uh, how long it will be, and how it will affect um, football, wrestling, or cheerleading in the uh, in between season this year. As Dr. Grossman mentioned earlier, our drama program performed It's a Wonderful Life virtually, which was a resounding success right before break, as well as Winter Coffee House or Fall Coffee House, which happened just before break as well, which had um, somewhere around 200 viewers, I believe, virtually, uh, which was very impressive overall. Um, Choir is also exploring digital options for a uh, for singing Valentine's, which is kind of a school tradition that we do every year, and we're hoping to uh, bring some festiveness to Valentine's Day. And uh, many quarantine students are excited to be back learning physically instead of virtually. Great. I know my kids always love the sing singing Valentine's, so I hope something can happen with that. Quick question. Um, are, are we still able to access the It's a Wonderful Life in the Coffee House on the YouTube page? Do you know? I believe so. Great. Any questions for the student representative, Mark? How's lunch going? Is it still as good as it was a couple months ago? 
for yourself? Uh, I think the lunches um, stay at the same quality. It's been wonderful uh, seeing all the new kind of meals that have come out of the new lunch program. I would just say I enjoy the variety. I think there's more options this year than there have been in the past. And it's um, easier to like switch up what you're eating each day. Thank you. Any other questions for our student reps? Trying to watch Jenny to see if she's coming up. No? Okay, we'll move on to the business manager's report. Yeah. Hi, Good evening. The November 2020 statement of accounts reflects the um, forecast of the cost of reopening the school with the protocols and materials that support the state of learning environment during the current pandemic. The forecast also projects the receipt of the general education secondary school emergency fund, as well as the COVID relief fund. Both of these grants are considered directly grants to the Board of Education and will be received and sent by the district in accordance with the procedures that have been established, practice, and model. The district received grant confirmation for both of these grants and now the ongoing procedure brought down this fund appropriately. After receipt of the grant funds, the general fund forecast is a negative $180,000. Special education is over budget two hundred and five thousand dollars, and regular education is better than budget by twenty five thousand dollars. Line items that are usually in over budget condition are custodial needed salaries, the cost of bus monitors, statutory unemployment contributions, and special education at the district tuition. These items are offset by favorable projections in certified salaries. Sarah, this is Jenny. Can you hear me? Thanks, Jenny. Um, just a comment that the Finance Committee did meet uh, in a special meeting and, and uh, reviewed these, I guess, just before Christmas. Um, I just want to note sort of big picture content uh, context um, behind all these numbers or, or so we can see the forest for the trees. Um, we've spent somewhere, I'm going to use very round numbers, um, over $700,000, $750,000 during this budget year for unbudgeted items related to COVID uh, in order to keep the schools open and do it safely. And thanks to the good work of uh, Anna and Jordan and others in securing grants and also savings, um, mostly from sal the salary line where we've had uh, less senior hires, we've been able to offset um, most of that, but well, all of that unbudgeted COVID expense in the general fund and the uh, uh, 
the $180,000 current budget shortfall is all driven by special ed. So um, I just think an amazing job has been done so far um, managing the monies uh, in this very tough year. Thanks, Jen. Any other questions or comments? Brandon? Uh, I know last summer we only had really special ed offerings over the summer and you know, the summer program was pretty much put to a halt. Is there any discussion about offering anything, even virtually small offerings? Yeah, so thank you Brandon for asking that question. Uh, I'll let Jen uh, chime in on that regarding a little bit of what we offered last summer for regular education students and then what the plan is for this summer. It may be touched upon later in the budget as well, but what we're looking to do is to bring back all of the offerings that we've had in the past. Uh, what we are trying to determine and we hope to determine by March or April is whether that will be able to occur in person or if that will be virtual again. And what were the benefits of doing it virtually because there definitely were some to have um, virtual options. But we'd actually, what you'll see proposed is actually an expansion of summer school offerings as opposed to um, a more limited as in the past, as it was last year. Compared to a normal year? Or? Expansion compared to a normal year, yes. Okay. Yeah. And would those be kind of remediation types of programming that you envision, or is it too early to say? One of the things I'm people is some work with our youngest readers and writers, um, and the, some of our students who just developmentally may have been impacted the most uh, uh, with COVID. Um, you'll also see some offerings um, around uh, preparing for AP courses and um, other things along those lines. And we've even started talking about, you know, you know sky's the limit. So we have some great ideas with summer school and you'll see more coming out with that. No other questions or comments? Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Now it's time for public comment. If we have anyone in the public who would like to comment, we'll start in house with the folks who are um, at, the, at the high school and then we'll move on to Zoom. If you are on the Zoom call and would like to public comment, please uh, make that known in the comments so our, um, you can be allowed to speak. Uh, just uh, procedurally, public remarks will be limited to five minutes for each speaker with a maximum of 20 minutes on each subject matter. People will be asked to identify themselves because the VOE is limited by the Freedom of Information Act to discussing only matters on the agenda. We are not permitted to engage in the discussion of the comments presented. Again, anyone who's here when you're speaking, please speak loudly into your microphone. Nobody in wants to speak? John, do we have anyone in Zoom who would like to have a comment? Doesn't look like it. Okay, as Melissa would say, we're going once, going twice. Thank you very much. Moving along to the consent agenda. Do I have a motion? I move that the Granby Board of Education adopt the consent agenda. Thank you, Brandon. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Rosemary. Any discussion? I know I had a couple comments of a minute that were able to be edited up beforehand. Um, any other comments? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstentions? Great. Thank you very much. Old business. High school building committee update. Is back to Anna again? <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. The school project still in the has been on a regular basis to consult with architects and administrators from both the town and the board of ed. In turn, our architects and administrators have formed working groups in order to gather information from our teachers, facilities personnel, and members in order to compile the information and develop preliminary designs. Few details on um, some of the projects that are in the works. The middle school group is close to completion, and the high school stairwell and science classrooms are through the design process. We go to um, start construction was in the summer of 2021. The committee is focusing this month on cafeteria, music space, tech ed space, and culinary arts space. 
Um, our schedule um, calls for our grant submission for these projects to the state by June 2021 for those projects. Um, the high school group replacement uh, classes will begin in November of 2021, with the actual replacement scheduled for summer of 2023. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions on those items. I'm just going to keep looking at the status. Are there any questions? Go ahead, Mark. Uh, thank you, and I apologize, I didn't ask this in subcommittee. So the, the um, cafeteria and the other projects that you mentioned where we're going to, uh, the goal is to get the grant submission by June of 2021. If everything went well, what, would we start those the following summer? What's the timeline? Yes, if everything went well, we would start those in um, the summer of 2022, and they will be um, tiered, they would all start at the same time, we would have to um, look at the construction estimates and see the best we get to those. Okay, thank you. Any other questions about the building committee update? We are moving really fast tonight. Oh, uh, okay, moving right along to the food service program. Jordan, I know you and Anna are going to kind of do that. Yeah, so if Anna's here, if, if there's any questions. So I'm very excited to, to report an initiative that Anna and her office have been working on regarding our food service program. And as you can see within the agenda, that through creativity and innovation of working with Fresh Picks, Anna and I reached out to the East Granby Public Schools. East Granby at this current time does not have a food service program. So they were very excited to hear from us. And if you remember for the past, you could go back, a lot of you have been on the board for a long time. One of the goals is to form cooperative relationships with other districts and other organizations. So this initiative of working with East Granby Public Schools regarding food services is a win for both school districts. Number one, the timing is appropriate because as you know, during COVID through the federal program, all lunches and all breakfasts are free for students. So with the calculations, this is a program that for every lunch that we make or breakfast that we make, we get reimbursed by the federal government for that, plus a, a little bit more funds that help us offset the cost. So when we reached out to East Granby, they were very interested in this proposal and in this concept. This has tremendous support from our own fresh picks because within our current level of management and staffing, we can take on the East Granby Public Schools. So what that initiated us to do was reach out to our attorneys to draw up a memorandum of understanding between the, both districts. It's a, this does not need board uh, vote. This is something that we're providing information. We met with the finance committee and gave them information a few weeks ago. We're still in final conversations with East Granby. One of the key components that we asked our attorneys to do and we asked Fresh Picks to do is to really look at if Granby needed to pull out that if we saw that this would be a financial risk to the Granby Public Schools, it is written in the memorandum of understanding and East Granby has tentatively agreed that we could bow out at any time. So this is something that each day we're gonna start with lunches. We're not gonna do breakfast yet that we would make the lunches and then we would bring the lunches over to East Granby and we would be reimbursed from the federal government regarding uh, the, the cost for those lunches. So it's a win-win, it's a win situation for us that we are getting more uh, money for the lunches that we are, are making. And then it's a win for East Granby to pilot this program to see how many students that East Granby has that would be willing to um, get lunch since they've never had lunch within their schools. 
this does not lock the Granby Public Schools into the 21 or 22, 23, 21, 22 school year of providing lunches or breakfast for the East Granby Public Schools. As I've said, we've asked Attorney Mooney to draft our memorandum of understanding that allows us to bow out of the, the program if we feel that we need to bow out of that program. So we're in the final stages of agreeing upon the memorandum of understanding. This has support from fresh picks that they feel that they could do it within the current management system, management personnel that they have. And if it does need to go to more staffing levels, it is something that they will calculate the meals that we are providing East Granby to make sure that the cost of those meals that were being reimbursed that would get us to have the staff level that we need to be reimbursed for the, the staffing level. So it has support from our own Fresh Picks company to, to do that. So it is something that the Board of Education has really been looking at over the past several years to how can we combine with other districts to kind of, I'll just lay it on the line, we're in the red right now within our food service program. This is something that could possibly turn that into the black. So it is something that we will monitor like we're doing right now on a daily basis, but we'll monitor in East Granby's very excited they spoke to their board of ed about it at the, the last meeting. And it, it's a good partnership to really begin conversations. Is there anything else that we could do within school systems to really look at combining services within the, the, the two towns that are so close um, together? So I'll, I'll leave it at that um, because that's where we are right now. And like I said, we presented it to the Finance Committee, and I'll entertain any questions, and Anna's here to entertain any questions uh, that you may have. Thanks, George. Mark, it looks like you have a question. No, not really a question, but um, a, a thank you and a, a recognition to Anna primarily and to Jordan for working on this. For those of you that haven't served on the um, Finance Subcommittee, our, our food services, like a lot of the tasks, is a very difficult one to manage, right? to do it in a way that we can provide more healthy options for our kids um, and maximize the benefit of federal funding that would other, otherwise be there. And we have to do it in a way to minimize the risk to our own taxpayers. So I'm very grateful that you took the time to explore this and give us this additional option. Um, and uh, we asked some pretty tough questions at the finance committee to, to make sure that we limited the risk to um, our district and our taxpayers, and so I'm very grateful for you having those answers and, and for uh, working through it. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. It's definitely a creative and innovative way to look at uh, budgeting and about and laying that foundation for uh, future cooperative relationships with other districts. Did you have a question yep. or a comment, Dave? Jordan, are you hopeful that in a post-pandemic situation that this lunch relationship will continue? So it, 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 in all honesty, it's something that we really got to look at. It, it, it's something that we're really going to, when it's federally funded, and we'll get a letter from the, the state once the memorandum is agreed upon to say that we can do it. But once that is, is done post COVID and pandemic, we really got to look at it. We got to look at it to say, is it beneficial to us? Is it beneficial to them? If it's something that we're able to kind of bow out at any time, then I, I would think that it'd be something that it, it may work. Um, but we really got to look at the numbers with fresh picks. It'd be more of a conversation with the, the finance committee to say, okay, here are our numbers. What are we thinking uh, about moving forward? The, the hope, uh, honestly, the hope taking what Jack said and what Jacob said and what our elementary school kids think and what our middle school kids think, they think the food's great, that it would be a win-win for both districts. This is not a new concept in the state of Connecticut with districts co combining their, their services. It just needs to be really drawn out in a, a really systematic and a programmatic way. Uh, Sarah, this is Jenny. Go ahead, Jenny, thank you. Thank you. Um, just to 
one other comment because we did discuss this in finance and and because um, uh, I'm sitting here thinking how you know people must be thinking how does this work it, it the whole lunch program is so volume driven um, that even outside of COVID um, it works for us to offer a lunch program uh, and to be part of the national lunch program if enough of our students that are able to are willing to actually buy lunch. Um, the COVID situation has created an opportunity because of the special national grant, um, uh, national program that, that you don't even have to pay for it. Uh, but, and it, it also makes this opportunity to explore with East Granby um, that much more viable in the short term. But if the food is good enough, which it seems to be, and, um, and East Granby finds the same thing that, that um, I'm, I'm actually very hopeful that that it will uh, prove to be viable um, even beyond the, uh, the national uh, program that's funding it now. But it'll depend on whether, um, whether enough families and kids want to actively participate in the program when we're back to buying food the way we normally do. Thank you, Jenny. I know we're just one family, but my son has loved this food program, and I know we'll be continuing with it um, when we pay for it. And I bet a lot of families would be saying similar. So thank you. Any other questions, comments? Oh, sorry, Jack. Um, so you were talking about going back and paying for it, and she was talking about the um, federal grant that we received. When does that um, like end? I know a few students have asked me when we're going back to. <laughs> If you're a senior, you're going to get lunch the rest of the year for free. Okay. Right? Right. So, so, <laughs> if you're a junior, you probably won't be getting it next year. It, it's the one good thing about COVID, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> he was getting a little concerned that his lunch would stop. So, <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the next agenda item. Uh, it's time for the plus one budget. Jordan, I know you've been working very hard on this. And just a reminder to board members, this is our first step in a very detailed process of reviewing the budget. Um, Jordan will be reviewing the timeline and kind of going over very high level. Um, this is our first look at this budget. Uh, so we can ask, we can be looking to ask high level questions tonight, but I know Jordan will be asking for us any more detailed or, or questions that might require a little bit more time to answer. Uh, Jordan will provide us a timeline of when we can submit those questions as, as we have in the past and he'll be answering those questions at our next meeting. Uh, and with that, Jordan, thank Super. you. Super, so thank you, Sarah. So it, it, it's interesting that board member Webster in an earlier meeting said, it, it seems like the budget just goes all year long. And that is the, the case, it just goes all year long. It's some of the most important work that this Board of Education does relative to the budget. Before I begin with the budget, I, I do have to thank the administrative team who's here tonight after a, a long day and I want, and their faculty meetings were today. So I just wanna thank the administrative team for all their work in putting the bu budget together since September. It's a very difficult year to put a budget together and you'll understand it as we go through, um, but I definitely wanna thank the administrative team and without the administrative team working with the teachers and their staff to develop the budget, the, it, the work would not be where it is today. So we gotta thank the administrators and the teachers for the work that they did with submitting a, a really, what I call a, a great budget proposal at each school or department based level. I do got to thank Anna for the work that she's done for putting the, the, this document together. And as we all know, Linda Powell, our unsung hero over there, really making sure that I'm ready to go for tonight. So I just want to thank everyone for everything that they have done. So as Chair Sarah said, it, we need to make sure that we understand that this is the first glimpse of the budget of where the superintendent and the administration stands right now. This is not the final budget. This is an opportunity for us to really go through and you understand where we are. What I need everyone to understand that the number that we're at now may not be the number that we're gonna be at at the superintendent's and administration's budget on March 3rd. 
As you can see from the slide, the first slide tonight, Board of Ed discussion on the FY22 plus one budget will come back on January 20th. I would ask that if you have any questions regarding the plus one budget, if you could submit those to myself, Anna and Linda, myself, Anna and Linda by January 13th. So we're prepared to answer those questions in the presentation on the 20th. The administrative budget presentation is March 3rd. Board of Ed workshops and budget adoption is March 10th, the 17th, the 24th. Town meeting and referendum April 12th and April 26th. There could be a time that Chair Thrall and I need to go to a board of finance meeting and explain the, the plus one uh, budget to them since there is no tri-board meeting scheduled at this time. So what I'd like to do at this time is to take you through the document. And for the members of the public that are on, this information, the plus one budget and the slides are on the website if you need them. I would ask the board members if you could stay with me on the, the pages so we could just stay one another. I'm not gonna go through this word for word. This is the first stab and the first look that you've had at this budget. What I can share with you is that the Board of Ed develops and submits a plus one budget to the Board of Finance. So the Board of Finance understands where we are at this time. Within the plus one budget is the operational budget, small capital budget, and some long range capital budget items. The plus one budget really gives the Board of Ed a preliminary look at the administrative team's initial priorities and planning challenges for budget fiscal year 22. I want to remind the board that we developed new board goals. And I want to remind the community of our goals because this plus one budget is developed on those goals. And that will be the theme throughout. Student learning and achievement is going to look different now that our instructional methods are looking different. Community engagement is important to this board. The safety and social emotional well-being is important to this board. The budget development and fiscal management of being fiscally responsible to the town of Granby and its constituents. Embracing diversity is being shown in this budget. And the professional learning that we need to provide our staff, students, and families are within this budget. I wanna let the board know that on the bottom of page one, the Board of Finance unapproved guideline is 1.5. Last year at this time, the Board of, Ed, on a board of Finance unapproved guideline was 2.99. Pre-COVID, at uh, one of the last board finance meetings pre-COVID on February 10, 2020 on the worksheet, the plus one was roughly about a 3.0 at this time. So we all know in these pandemic times that we are in a, a difficult budget year. Retirements make up one certified employee Health benefits is an average of 5.5 cost change over FY21. And this includes census changing at a rate of an increase of 10%. So now if we could go to page two. Within transportation, this includes one new bus equipped with a lift that replaces the existing bus. Salaries, I want to remind the board what we're dealing with within salaries. Anticipated retirement 0 0.09, administrative increase 3.9%, teachers increase 2.52. If you remember the teachers last year was roughly about a 0.4. And placeholder at 3% for the remaining bargaining groups. 
Utilities, this is a moving target within this budget. Oil, 2.03 per gallon, electricity, 0.73. Again, we will be looking at that. Special education is an increase, a budget of $495,000. Special education represents 19.79 of the total budget. Fees and tuition, if you recall from one of our last meetings, we said that we were not gonna increase any fees or any tuition. Enrollment, this was very difficult and we'll talk about that when we get down to the enrollment. But enrollment, it is going to move from 1779, reflects an increase of 56 students. The issue that we have this year is we had 36 students that have moved to homeschool. So we have to account that some of those students are gonna be coming back next year. Quality, quality and diversity, maintain a five-year positive balance, which we'll talk about. And as you recall, we'll have a separate meeting to go over the quality and diversity fund. And then a, a new requirement that I wanna remind the board, and I think you all know, and, remind, and let the community know, that there's a new item called other post-employment benefits, OPEP. That's a contribution that we have not had to give before. So you're gonna see two numbers in my plus one, $253,000, which represents within a budget of a 0.79. So you can see that I'm gonna give you two numbers tonight. And the two numbers, and John, if you could go, there we go. We're, we're gonna have two slides. That based upon the above options, this year's plus one budget is 3.71 without the OPEP, and then 4.50 with OPEP. So I wanna remind you, 3.71 without OPEP, and then 4.50 with OPEP. Now we did not do this last year within the plus one, but I think it's important for you to understand what we refer to as our standing still number. I just did this with the 3.71. You could see with salaries, transportation, health benefits, fuel, oil, natural gas, and contracted nurses services, because our contract is up, that alone is a 2.24 increase. When you add in the quality and diversity operation budget, which is moving over staff, which has been a board goal to move staff from the quality and diversity to the operational budget, and you take special education costs, that right there is a 3.24 of our budget. So if you wanna really know what a standing still number for us to move from this year to next year, it's 3.24. The remainder net additions and retirement savings is $177,000. So that represents roughly around a 0.47 of new money to the, the, the budget of new additions and re reductions that we're adding to this budget. So again, our standing still number is around 3.24, and this represents with all with the net additions and reductions a 3.71. And again, that is without OPEP. If you add OPEP in, that brings us up to 4.5. I just threw a lot at you if you have any questions so far. I did what she said no. Oh, I was just sorry. I was just looking for Jenny's face up there. Mark, you do have a question. Go ahead. I do, but I can wait till the end. Okay. Thank so, you. Yeah, I'll keep going. So there's another line item in there within page two. It's called pandemic related expenses. We calculated within this budget, but it's not included in the number, but we're giving it to the board. 
is $60,000 additional cleaning supplies and 285,250 of additional custodial staff. That if we need to open up our buildings like we opened up this year, next year, these are funds that we will need. But what we are saying is these numbers are not listed in the FY22 plus one budget, but we want to be very transparent of what we would need if we need to open up the schools like we did this year. What we really don't want to do is include this in our budget because what would happen is with the minimum budget requirement set forth by the state of Connecticut, that would mean that the town would be responsible for giving us that much money the following year. But we do want to be very transparent with that's the money that we would need if we had to open up the schools this year or for next year. Enrollment, as I mentioned, this is something that is very tricky. We had NESDEC do our reports again for this year. And what we asked them to do also is to include our students that were homeschooled. So you can see that our actuality was 1723 for this year, and we're projecting to be 1779, 1790, 1845, 1841, 1837. So you can see that there is a steady increase in our growth over the next five years. So I'll move to page three. <coughs> Small capital budget. You can see, I'll just go with the total. You can see approximately $1 million. This number for small capital is aligned with what the Board of Finance has recommended us to come in at. Technology expenses of $3,000 will support existing leases, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So again, I gave you two charts so you can see the long debit, the long term of what budget projections would be. So a reminder, last year, this year's budget, approved budget was a 2.92. Our FY22 right now, plus one is the 3.71. Without OPEB and our operating budget with OPEB is 4.5. And the next one, the quality of diversity, which I said we will have a separate meeting is our quality of diversity next year will be above a million dollars. And that's a projection of having 81 open choice students attend the Granby Public Schools. And if you recall, as I said earlier, that the quality of diversity, you'll see within the next items that I will talk about that we needed to move staff members, part of the board goals, we needed to move staff members from the quality of diversity to the operational side. So for the 21-22 school year, this is now on page four, what are some of the things that are making up the $155,000? Is it 155 or 177? 177. And for the 21 22 school year, I'm going to go through these as we're going into the out years. I'll let you read through those yourself. But for the 21 22 school year, we need a Kelly Lane grade two teacher to meet the needs of the current class size and sections for grade one. We currently have seven sections of grade one students at Kelly Lane. We need to have seven sections of grade two at Kelly Lane. We currently do not have seven sections in grade two. We have six sections in grade two. You can see this is the two kindergarten teaching assistants from Kelly Lane moved from the quality and diversity into the operating budget. That's a total of $47,000. Number three, did you recall as part of the plus one budget last year, 
we recommended an assistant director of pupil services. With great dialogue with Amy Martin, we really decided to make that into a K through five special education instructional coach for Kelly and Wells to assist with the increasing caseload of special education students and to oversee some of the district programming decisions made at the elementary school while still maintaining a small teaching caseload. Mrs. Martin felt that this would assist her and the growing number of our special education students and really give us some great alignment at the K-5 level. Strings teacher, expansion of the strings program to grade five. This is something that has been in the plus one and part of the strings program strategic plan. At the middle school, we are reducing a 1.0 FTE. That's due to the, the scheduling that scheduling change that Mr. Rye is working on. As we go through the budget process, I will ask Mr. Rye and Mr. Parsons to give you and provide you an update on what the middle school schedule would look like through the committee work that he's doing right now. If you recall, one of the board goals is really looking at the social emotional well being of our students. There was a proposal for a 1.0 social worker at the middle school and the high school. I am proposing a 0.5 social worker at the middle school and the high school to address the social emotional well being of our students at those two schools. Teaching assistants, Kelly Lane, middle school and high school to accommodate current students new to the district since the prior year was passed, as well as preschool students in need of significant support moving up to kindergarten. Certified occupational therapist assistant, if you recall, this was a position last year that was put in the budget at 0.5. I reduced it in my in my final proposal last year to a 0.25 and said that I would come back this year and go with the, the other 0.25. Wilson Reading Tutor to accommodate students with dyslexia throughout the district. And then some of the notables that you'll see in the elementary content area specialist at Kelly Lane. If you recall, last year we added, for this year we added a content elementary school specialist at the Wells Road Intermediate School. And our plan is to add one at Kelly Lane that will support the school, the operation of the SAR, assessment, the BAS, discipline support, creation of elementary scheduling, and the SRBI process. You'll see at Kelly Lane, and you'll see this again at Wells Road, the middle school and the high school have school leadership teams and leadership positions. Kelly Lane and Wells Road do not have that structure. So you'll see that this team is for stipends for the team to meet monthly to identify the school's efforts to improve student performance and reach the educational goals and functions of the school community. The next one, the social emotional learning of Kelly Lane to continue the social emotional learning work at the school level. All teachers will receive initial responsive classroom training to support tier one social emotional work. This looks like it's going to be in the Title II grant. And there's the school improvement for Wells Road. The next one we've spoken about before, it's the PSAT testing for the middle school. Expansion of the PSAT administered to grade eight students in order to monitor progress towards ultimate goals of the school SAT in the spring of their junior year. Now I'm on page five. English new textbooks, this was spoken about from curriculum committee. The DECA program, the stipend for the club advisor was pre previously taken out of the Perkins grant funds which we do not receive right now, that the district can pick up the stipend after two years. 
serve safe certification to allow students to certify and obtain jobs in the food service industry in high school or college professional development high school to provide ap training for exploration of college and career pathways in ap spanish and culture and ap capstone seminar teaching a new program that Jen was mentioning with our summer school is an AP summer boot camp, one week academic enrichment camp for students who are enrolling in advanced placement courses. And then you'll see here a $5,000 for football, the seventh year of additional funding of the football program. A new program, a new position, a K-12 music content area specialist. This position will provide oversight over the K-12 music program. We're spending a lot of money on music and there's no oversight for music. So we feel that we need a content area specialist. And I'm very excited to report that based upon conversations within our school improvement or our diversity plan that we are engaged in work with CREC to increase minority recruitment of staff members by participating in the CREC minority teacher and residence program. That'll be coming out of the quality and diversity for $65,000 and that would bring a teacher into our district that we would train that is a minority background and that after they're done being trained, they will be there'll be a position for them at the elementary level within the Grammy Public Schools. The next ones are the 22-23 year in going out. I will let you read that at your leisure and be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have at the next meeting. So before I get into the small cap, I, I think it'd be a good time to, to pause and, and take some questions regarding what I just spoke about and then we can go into the small cap. Thank you, Joyce. I know it's a lot that we're all kind of digesting as we see this for the first time. Does anyone have any questions that they'd like to ask of Superintendent Wilson? Uh, just one at the moment, Jordan. You, uh, I guess, number one for the staffing, the additional Kelly Lane teacher. Um, the, the upcoming kindergarten, first grade, they're also gonna require seven sections. Yeah, so what we're doing right now is we're projecting kindergarten at seven sections, first grade at seven sections, second grade at seven sections. And right now we currently have seven, seven and six. Okay. So that's gonna be a recurring year to year additional teacher as- it, it, it won't be. Once we get to seven, it will mean that we have seven at Kelly Lane. The only thing that would change is possibly kindergarten if we had less students. Just my follow-up actually to that question. Is there an impact at Wells Road? Are there seven sections in there? No, so the, the six sections that will go from second grade will cover the six sections that they would need for third grade. Mark, did you want something? Yeah, I, I, I know you want to try to keep the questions to a high level. Send in leads questions out of them writing. So one of these or two of these leaks into the end of the leads, just let it know. Um, back on the first page where we you, you kind of broke down the 3.71, the eight. Pretending for a second. And I know this isn't directly relevant. I'm just trying to put some context on this. Tell for a second that we could have kept the plus or minus 900,000 that we didn't spend last year and held it in reserve and then spent it this year. Do you know what that percentage of 3.71 would be? Anna, we, we, we know this number. So the, the question was the, the 907, seven, the 900,000 dollars that we gave back, how would that offset the 3.71? That's approximately 3%, that's approximately 3% of our budget. However, the Board of Education is not allowed to hold reserves, so that would be at the, at the, at the town. So for the community that came here, it's approximately 3% of what our budget. So that would knock it down to a 0.71. It won't. 
Yeah, yeah, that's what Anna's saying. Am I correct, Anna? Anna, can you come up here, please? Thank you. You could do it right in the middle of So basically, the 3% the that we're talking about doesn't relate to the FY22 budget. However, if you just want to talk generally about numbers, 3.71 less 3% is 0.71. That 900,000 that we sent back to the town goes into the town's general fund. I get that. I, I know it's, it's okay. So I, I just fictional. To... I just want to okay. Try to okay. Thank you. And then my next question uh, had two questions related uh, to the diversity and the minority uh, training. Again, if these are actually, I have a number of questions related to that, but the two that I think are the big issue questions are. Um, so the years out, this the, what you have here in year one is the initial cost, right? The, the years out, can you save me the trouble of reading through the- Yeah, so the years out, what we've done, to make sure that we have a long range plan, is the years out is we'll join the program again and bring another teacher in. So one of the things is to make sure that we have sustainability and fidelity with minority recruitment. So year one, $65,000, that covers one teacher. The second year out, we did another teacher. Third year out, we did another teacher. And specifically, um, so let's just stick with one for now because that's easy for me to understand. So the, the first year we were funded out of quality and diversity. In the future years, are they shown, are they contemplated to be out of quality and diversity or back in the operation? So good question. So if the, the $65,000 for the first year, take it as the teacher is being trained. Right. After they're done with the training, we hope that there would be a possible retirement right. or someone leaving that the, the teacher would take that job, then it goes, that salary would be an operational budget. Year two, the training happens, that's quality and diversity. Hopefully there's a job for that individual, then that goes into the operational budget. All right, and my last, I think, big question, big issue. Uh, question related to this is, did, have we approached um, the Granby Education Foundation about this and, and see if they're, they're willing to help support this program in any way? We have not approached them yet, no. I'd sure like us to at least try. We'll do that one. That's it, thanks. Thank you, Mark. Anyone else? Oh, go ahead, Dave. On the, uh, on the old tab, is that the kind of obligation that you don't pay it now, we're going to pay it later? And an answer for that is correct. Correct. So that is something that we work closely. That is facing the town side, the selectmen, and us. And it's something that we're working with the Board of Finance. That's why I needed, I wanted to show it as um, two separate numbers, how OPEP uh, affects us. And then eventually we as a board have to decide how that's gonna uh, play out within our number. And it could be conversations with the Board of Finance from now until the superintendent's budget on March 1st. That, that's why I say this budget right now, this is a difficult budget to put together relative to OPEP, relative to pandemic, and relative to just our contractual increases to move forward. And just explain maybe a little more of what OPEP is. I'm not even- And I'm gonna let you jump in on that. So you get the scientific explanation for OPEP. OPEP stands for other post-employment benefits. And we are required to provide um, provide health insurance on an ongoing basis for our retirees. Um, they do pay into the fund. Um, however, there is, there is a cost to that. So the OPEP fund ensures that we don't run out of money. So it's a, it's a long-term liability. 
Um, we currently have a fund established, which is um, very progressive. Um, according to our auditors in the state of Connecticut, those types of um, those types of progressive things make really attractive for bonding, makes us financially stable because we acknowledge and fund our long-term liabilities. So, you know, that is an obligation that we have um, as, a, as a town for municipal employees and for our, um, our board of employees. Thank you. I have uh, one more question. Um, Dr. Fauci, the other day on the evening news, said something to the effect of he expects herd immunity to be achieved by about August. So is the operating assumption for the budget in Farmington Valley School superintendents that pretty much in school in place next fall without remote learning and, or maybe it's too soon to ask that question? I think it's too soon to ask that question. I, I can tell you tomorrow, unless something changes, we'll be in school full, uh, but we'll still have remote learners. It all depends what the state of Connecticut decides relative to options that families have. If they're gonna continue remote learning and the option for families to have remote learning, remember that was a state of Connecticut guideline that they said to all schools that you have to provide remote learning. I have, at this time, I have no idea what the, the State Department of Education is going to say regarding August. Um, but fair question. Thank you. I'm just looking at the screen to see if Jenny had any questions that you wanted to ask. Uh, I guess I would just follow up on that. If I was following your presentation right, Jordan, you identified two items of um, potential COVID, COVID related expense in this budget, um, 60,000 for cleaning and 220 or something for extra custodians. And you sort of identified that separately because it's a, it's a, uh, because it related to the, a pandemic situation that may or may not be there. And so you identified that. My, so my assumption was that other than that, the rest of this, this budget is being presented sort of assuming we're back to the normal world. Is, did I not understand that right? So there, there, that's twofold. Number one, the 60 for the custodial and the, um, for the, the, the numbers that I gave, that is something that we know that if we had to open up the doors next year in the same way, we would need those funds and the cleaning supplies. So yeah, we, we in other words, we know that if we have to open up the doors the same way we did this year, we know we'd need them. So in other words, there, it, it's, a, it's a projection of potential need if we're still worried about COVID. Correct. That, and that's the only thing that we need. Our model okay. is working right now. And if we needed to open up the same way next year that we're currently operating today on January 6th, our model would stay the same. We refine things, of course. But right now, as you know, K through five, we have teachers for each one of those grade levels. And for six through 12, we're operating that kids can uh, stream it. So from an instructional standpoint, we would just refine. From a cost standpoint, I don't see any cost to function the way that we are functioning right now. There's no other deltas that, other than these? No, no. Good question. Sarah, can I follow up on that real quick? Yeah. So I just wanna make sure I understand. Let's, let's go just back to the additional custodial staff costs that you identified in case we have restrictions. Assuming we don't, budget reflects pre-COVID custodial staff? Correct. Okay. Correct. So that's why I, I went out there and really highlighted the 60,285 that if we open up in the fall, like we were planning, 
to open up this fall, we would be absolutely fine. But we just want to be very transparent with our board of finance that this is that is funds that we may have to come back to and, and ask for that it's something that is not budgeted for. Right. So, so conversely, we're saying to the board of finance that we didn't add any additional custodial staff this year because of special needs that you built into the budget going forward. Correct. Thank you. That's brand new. Um, going back to the OPEP for a second. Um, it sounded like that was something that is currently already established. Is there a reason that we spiked it out uniquely this year? Anna? There is a reason. There is a reason. So in the past, you were able to have custodial staff for the insurance fund? Sorry. So it sounds like there's an option to defer that to next year. There actually is. There actually is no option to defer that. It does it would, it would remain unfunded, which would um, is not advisable. It's, it's not a responsible way to handle the fund. Um, but there is a fund in place, so I guess from the assessment, deferring it, though bad, isn't the end of the world. You know, I would have to I would have to let the town speak to whether or not it's a it's a healthy thing to do fiscally. Um, it does um, things like those types of rules are not great for our when we want to bond, when we do other kinds of municipal funding, those long-term liabilities are very important to debtors. So it's not just our budget that that depends on. So I would have to defer that to to the town board finance. Okay, I was just curious the way it was presented. I, I, I think it's presented that way because um, initially we did not know that we needed to cover that expense. And when the Board of Finance gave us an official guideline of 1.5%, that number was not in consideration. So in order to present a budget, um, that um, comes at least close to the 1.5% that represents what that number was intended to represent in the first place. Um, we just spiked it out just to show show the impact. Okay, thank you. I would, I would just say this because I have a, just a teeny little bit more background in this, which I guess probably will too. So there is some, the bottom line is there is some flexibility on how much we keep in this fund. And, when we fund it and how we fund it, because it's a town obligation, right? We're just trying to allocate portions between which relate to town employees and which relate to. And so I think it was advisable and smart for Jordan to call it out separately because it's going to be part of what we are working on together with the Board of Finance and the Board of Selectmen is to figure out how to do this in a way that we don't have to pay for it once later, but in a way that it doesn't necessarily hamper what we're trying to get done in the year. Okay, so if we go to page eight, and again, I'm going to go through this really quickly because you need to really digest this. This is the small cap, and I want to thank Shannon, who's here tonight, for all the work that he did putting this document together with his staff and with Anna and the administrators. If you can see furniture and pictures, equipment, 52,378. You can see that there's some highlights in there with laser machines for outstanding technology education program. We really need to look at the sound booth within the high school regarding the $6,000. And then the last one I really want to highlight is the playground reconfiguration at Wells Road. If you remember, we have in the budget for this year a study being done on our Wells Road uh, playground area. You can see for maintenance. And Anna spoke about the building projects tonight. 
our staircase building project regarding the, the high school, that is something that we know is not going to be state reimbursed. We know that already. And so what we've done is we budgeted for the staircase and the ADA compliance for the science classroom at $138,000 and $8,000 respectively. So this is something that this covers a differential of what was being in the bond and then what is the, the, the rest of that project. And then another one that I want to highlight is that there's been a lot of talk and conversation regarding the press box for the high school field and the groups and organizations that are really wanting to get involved in the helping of funding this project. So there is funding in there for the architecture and the engineering design of the press box. Another one that I'd like to highlight is we need to do a lot of work in updating of our fire alarm panels. So you can see the total maintenance is approximately $382,264. I'll take you over to page nine with technology. Technology is an increase of $266,000. The main line items within this is looking at our leasing and our existing leasing program. And then the replacement of existing technology, we're looking at interactive display boards for the middle school and the high school. We need to replace the central surface phone system replacement and the Kelly Lane primary school phone system replacement. All these items were within the, the plus one last year, projecting out of where we were. Emergency repair and equipment is 22,000. And then transportation, 271,000. And the, the big ticket item within there is our 171 to 77 passenger lift uh, bus for 90,000. And then there's some other uh, equipment there relative to custodial maintenance. So that would make up, as I mentioned before, the $1 million that we are looking at for capital. And then the last page on page 10, there are a few items that were hard items that were proposed within the administrative budget that are not in this budget. Not to say, not in the plus one, not to say they may not appear in the administrative budget based upon the final budget, based upon conversations that we have. But there was a, an instructional coach for humanities proposed at the elementary school that has been spoken about at the curriculum committee level. Social worker, if you recall, I did put in point five for the middle school and the high school. It was proposed at a 1.0. There were teaching assistants, three of them that were proposed, and, or five of them that were proposed. I cut that down in two. And then there was a part-time secretary for pupil services at around approximately $30,000. And then furniture and fixtures, you can see most of what was proposed we did cover. So at this time, this is where we land. We land at a 3.71 without OPEB and a 4.5 with OPEB. And if you recall, our standing still numbers are around a 3.24 <coughs> with 0 .55, 0 0.5, approximately of new additions. So as Sarah said in the beginning, um, I'll answer any questions now that are high level, but if we can, email Linda, myself, and Anna with any questions that you have. And traditionally, the second meeting after the, the plus one is we have a presentation and we just go through every question that, that people have. And it allows the team, if we can get that by the 13th, it allows Linda and Anna and I to send it out to the individual members that can answer those questions. And then if we need people to explain some more things in, in detail, they'll also be here pending the, those questions that you have as a board. So I'll take any questions right now. 
Any questions for Jordan regarding the budget or the timeline? I know it's a lot. Take it home, sleep with it underneath your pillow, read it at your leisure. Thank you, Jordan. That's an awful lot of work. Thank you to the administration as well. All of your hard work on putting together a budget. Very thoughtful and difficult time to be putting a budget together, I'm sure. We will move on to standing report. And the first one will actually come from the Curriculum Policy Technology and Communications Committee, which I will report on uh, this month. And we'll gladly turn that over to Rosemary for next month. Uh, we had a very short meeting tonight when we met. Um, Jen Parsons provided her monthly report, just a few highlights from that monthly report that I think folks might be interested in hearing. Uh, She's been working hard uh, nonstop over the past month. They are nearing the completion at the middle school of the discussion of the scheduling, uh, and we'll be reporting out about that at some point in the near future. Uh, they are looking at scheduling testing for 2020 to 2021. And this includes the SBAC and the um, science, science testing. They weren't sure if that was going to be something that was going to be scheduled, but it does appear as though the state is looking to proceed with for that testing, just to establish the baseline, uh, not necessarily to use it as an accountability measure. The team has been pulled together to develop the vision of the graduate. I know we've talked a little bit about that in the past, and I think we're going to be seeing more and more of that as time goes on. Uh, obviously, a lot of work has been spent this past month in developing the budget. And the equity team um, has met and has been continuing their work and we have asked that they provide an update to the full board at a meeting in the spring. So we're going to wait until after budget time and then have that team uh, report out to us once, uh, once the spring time gets here. Uh, we then received a, a curriculum update and Jennifer is reviewing the curriculum cycle. Currently the cycle includes math, music, and capstone but we really wanted to look at that very holistically. So she's going to kind of just take a step back and a deep breath and kind of review that whole cycle and um, will provide us with a, with a proposal for what that's going to look like moving forward in terms of how we look at our curriculum and how we look at when it is revised and updated. And I think that was, that was what we covered tonight. Would you like to add anything, Jen? Rosemary or Brandon, did I miss anything? Got it, okay, great. We will move on then um, to the finance committee. I know we had a meeting, a special meeting that was held just um, actually just prior to our break. Jenny, did you want to report out on that? Um, I, I would, except we've pretty much touched on everything. We mm -hmm. talked about the food program, the building committee, and the accounts. So I think we're all up to date. Great. Thank you very much. Other board reports, Crack and Cave, Mark, anything to report out on those? Um, correct. I uh, actually had a teleconference with me last week uh, that was focused on uh, presenting with their legislative priorities. Um, I wasn't able to attend the, the teleconference, but uh, we did issue sort of a four or five pager that summarized um, and I can circulate to anybody who wants to see it. Um, it's mostly funding related recommendations to the legislature, um, particularly making sure that they continue to adequately fund both open choice and the other required correct program. So uh, if you want a copy of that, I, I gave it to uh, uh, Jordan. And so I'll let you know where I know what I'm going to do. I believe we're back on schedule uh, two weeks from now. We're, we're starting to again. Okay. And I know usually annually they have uh, their legislative breakfast uh, usually held, I think, in February, which I'm sure they're not doing. They are. They're going to do the So once I get details on that, Thank you. Grammy Education Foundation. Jenny, anything to report out for them? I have no update. Um, I think there's a meeting next week. There is a meeting on Monday. I attended a meeting last week, uh, or two weeks ago, I think it was. Thank you. Calendar of events, I know it's included at the end of our packet. Uh, midterms are coming, so brace yourselves, gentlemen. Uh, those will be coming soon. And any questions about the upcoming calendar of events? 
All right, board announcements. Fantastic. Rosemary, any action items? Uh, no, other than to get any questions to Jordan and Anna uh, and Linda. Thank you. And I believe there's no need for executive session tonight, so I will take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Dave, thank you. A second? Second. Brandon, thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thanks.